Tuesday because I personally had trouble uh, locating it online. Um, so one, one student, I believe Chloe says uh, she was, I'm, uh, I'm happy to help you all find one. It should be fairly easy to find one online because it's, it's open access, but there's a few, you have to click on the, on the PDF link on the cambridge.org. Otherwise it's also available on ResearchGate. Just a little tip for, for those of you who may not know sometimes when you're looking for like uh, a, a free access, a free version of an article, and if you're not on the McGill VPN, although you should be when you connect for class, is just Google the title of the article in between scare quotes and then PDF, and then typically there's one somewhere. It's extremely rare. Um, yeah, just for some reason, when I was on the Cambridge website, and even though I logged in with my institutional ID for McGill, yeah. uh, I still couldn't, I was return an error message. So maybe if the person who found it was able to find it, I, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who has this issue, but. Um, uh, Brenda, like the last icon, if you click on like PDF, at, like do you have three choices on the library um, website? So if you click on the last one, it's work and you see the PDF directly and you don't have to buy, to pass by the uh, another academic institution. Okay, thank you. I'll try that. There's a little bit of interference. Okay, thank you. I'm going to begin because I, I have uh, a sort of a ambitious aims for today. Uh, okay. All right, I hope everyone is here. Great. So on the course outline, I had said that I would start talking about cultural consonants. Uh, a, for the purpose of helping you think of a possible option for your assignment, and B, because it's a really interesting way to operationalize the construct of culture and think of the ways in which culture matters and culture is protected. So I'm not actually going to talk about cultural consonants today, almost at all, because I've decided that we're not ready for that part of the conversation yet. But suffice it to mention again that cultural consonants is a way to measure how culture is protected. So cultural consonants is the extent to which people feel uh, they're able to live up to whatever locally relevant norms in a domain of culture. Uh, and cultural consonance is basically the mismatch between what people expect in terms of what they think is culturally expected of them and what they actually get in their life. So uh, different domains of culture, and we're gonna keep studying this idea of different cultural domains. It's for example, material life, for example, say among Western educated, industrial, rich, democratic uh, people, there's an idea that you have, you have to have, I don't know, like a, a house or a mortgage by, by a certain age, but cultural consonance has been shown to be protective, to even protect against uh, cardiovascular diseases and bad mental health above and beyond socioeconomic status. So if you take some groups like the Amish or the Hasidim, the, the Orthodox, some ortho, Orthodox Jewish communities who are not very materially wealthy, uh, but who have different goals, say one ought to be a scholar or one ought to have a rich family life. Well, these, these communities actually have pretty good metrics in terms of a lot of uh, health and mental health status. So one of the hypotheses is that there are some very strongly culturally cohesive, but also attainable goals uh, that end up modulating well-being in all kinds of ways. But today I want to begin talking about uh, cultural evolution and human evolution. And I want to begin, or rather to continue to operationalize the construct of culture so today, my aim is to, if I can, and if not, it's okay because we'll have time on Thursday, um, to briefly tell you or invite you to consider three different ways of looking at human evolution uh, with complexity and resilience in mind. So trying to examine the ways in which humans have been and are a very resilient species and to try to ask different questions around, around that notion and to interrogate the place, of, the place of culture, but also of different kinds of culture, different kinds of cultural packages. So I want to begin with a few definitions, um, and all of these will be recurring themes throughout the semester, uh, very important constructs and concepts, and the, the way in which I study cultural evolution and want 
to invite you all to consider uh, ways of looking at cultural evolution. So as it happens, I mean, I am interested in resilience, but I'm not super interested in resilience. I'm much more interested in the construct of uh, anti-fragility. So first, a disclaimer, notions like fragile and anti-fragile, they're not moral claims here. There's nothing moralizing. So if at some point we come to describe a particular cultural system as exhibiting signs of fragility, we're, this is not a moral judgment. In fact, as we will see, uh, weakness and vulnerability is a key strength of the human species, in particular, the human ability um, to understand and attend to one another's vulnerability. Here I'm simply borrowing a metaphor uh, from the material sciences. In fact, some of you may, may not know, like, like the notion of stress, the notion of resilience comes from uh, basically systems engineering and material sciences. And resilience describes the properties of a material that after encountering a stressor, so some disorder or some unexpected thing in the environment, bends back into its original shape. Now, anti-fragility is just a, another metaphor, but it's more something like post-traumatic growth that maybe we'll get to talk about a bit. So it's this idea of properties of a system that are able to uh, not just adapt and bend back, but grow and in fact thrive from encountering stress, disorder, in danger. The question, as we will see, is, is the human species anti-fragile? Or when, how, and where might we say that there is anti-fragility in human cultural forms of life? But a few more metaphors to help you grasp and wrap your head around some of these concepts. So take uh, the orchid, for example. It's a metaphor used in psychology. So orchids are really beautiful, um, but they require a very specific regime of care, of light, of being attended to. Otherwise, as I'm sure many of you might have failed, in I certainly have in trying to keep an orchid alive. I'm good at raising kids, but not plants myself. I don't have that proverbial green thumb. Um, so orchids are fragile. And again, this is not a moral judgment. And it's, in fact, they're quite beautiful. They're extraordinary creatures and beings. However, they're not particularly Resilient. Another common metaphor, take uh, the oak. So the oak is robust, meaning it, it's very strong. It, it resists a lot of change in the environment. But uh, as the famous fable goes, sometimes the wind is too strong. The, the, oak, the oak gets uprooted. So robust is also not quite it in terms of uh, resilience or certainly anti-fragility. The proverbial reed, of course, is much more resilient. We know that the reed uh, bends in the wind and bends back in its original shape. So often, as the famous fable goes, you know, we, we, we want to be like the reed rather than like the oak. So another metaphor to show how sometimes some naive ideas of like, say, macho strength, not very good, not very resistant to and resilient in the face of change. Now, in, in introducing our next character here, I'm committing a category mistake because I could not really find uh, an anti-fragile plant. Often the dandelion is described as a very resistant, very resilient, perhaps anti-fragile plant, like weeds that grow everywhere in different kinds of climates, don't require a whole lot of care in order to be autonomous. But something really anti-fragile is uh, our new friend, Covida, our new friend, the coronavirus. Uh, COVID-19. COVID is, COVID is the very definition of anti-fragility. And let, let, let's pause to think of how in a minute. First, unlike, say, Ebola, which is a very fragile virus, Ebola kills its host in about 24 hours. It doesn't really spread. So COVID kills only the most of the most fragile of humans. And this is very sad for humans, but mostly it has uh, a fast replication rate that has a slow incubation period. So it's really, really good at maintaining itself alive. But it's more, it does more than that. Because soon we're going to talk about the interdependency and the co-construction, niche construction of different species. So COVID is not just a really good human hunter. In fact, it doesn't really hunt humans because it doesn't kill most of them. COVID is more like a human farmer. 
you'll see, you, we've seen how in the past nine months or so, the COVID event has like drastically reshaped human migration patterns, put humans in different spaces where they become more vulnerable to infection, completely changed the whole world. So that's very, very anti-fragile. Yes, you had a, you had a question. Yeah, can I say this is the room? There are people in the waiting room. I can see them here, let me see. Admit. Okay. Thank you. So again, the metaphor, right? Fragile orchids, resilient reeds, robust oaks, anti-fragile COVID. Another concept that we're gonna keep re-exploring is that of entropy because it's particularly relevant to contemporary paradigms and how we're beginning to understand dynamics of the brain, but also of bodies and of all kinds of living systems and living organisms. So entropy, another metaphor borrowed from theoretical physics here, in popular parlance, we tend to think of entropy as meaning chaos or disorder, but in information theoretic terms, entropy mostly refers to the amount of possible states that are available to an organism in a given system. So for humans, say, what you can do, what you can imagine, what you can feel, sort of where you can go. And we can think of systems as more to less anti-entropic. A very interesting range on a curve of uh, too little entropy to too much entropy is what mathematicians call criticality, or in more popular parlance against the age of chaos, the optimal range of states between too few states and too many states, criticality. So you can think again of criticality as a synonym for anti-fragility, where any given system, and we're gonna keep reviewing examples today and throughout the semester of cultural systems, social systems, economic systems, as basically containing different levels of entropy. Some of them with too few states are very rigid. For example, uh, Again, think of like a solid, uh, like the oak, you know, not as many iterations uh, of movement as the reed. Or again, a, a liquid uh, disintegrates and dissipates much faster than a solid or a rock. But of course, as humans and, and as, as cultural species, we're neither rocks nor fluids. Uh, and, and although it doesn't have to be a moral story, but if we examine when humans, I suppose, survive the best in the most harmonious ways with perhaps other species and other groups of humans, we're typically within that, that kind of age of chaos, that, that critical range, criticality. So the question again, are humans anti-fragile? Or a better question, when, where, and how can humans be anti-fragile? So what I wanna to cover today are three hypotheses, but also three different ways of looking at human history and human evolution. The first one is one that all of us have been taught in school since elementary school, one that is deeply ingrained uh, in, in Western culture. Uh, to some extent, deeply ingrained is some ways in which universally the human psyche might operate, but it is also a rather typical kind of Western history of progress. So the idea that human evolution went from fragile to anti-fragile, uh, from simple to complex, and that as humans, we have had immense evolutionary success given our very humble beginnings. The second hypothesis is what you might call more of an anarchist reading of evolution and history, uh, much more counterintuitive, uh, novel for many people, perhaps not all, it's the idea that it's rather the opposite, that humans went from anti-fragile to fragile, that human evolution over the past two million years on all kinds of levels has gone from more complex to more simple. And there we have some evidence of so-called evolutionary mismatch, maladaptiveness, ways in which the environments that we have now devised are uh, a very poor match for our evolved cognitive architecture and our evolved physiological architecture causing all kinds of problems that we'll review. These are the kinds of problems that uh, we review in a lot more depth in 
uh, in the course that I teach on psychopathology, mind and brain, and evolutionary psychiatry. And then we'll conclude, if we have time today, I hope so, with, a, with an again more, more, more complex, more theoretically anti-fragile, non-linear hypothesis, where it's not that simple. It's not A or B. It's not from complex to simple or from simple to complex. It depends. It's context dependent, but there are patterns. Um, and there are ways of understanding patterns of those interdependent pathways. So this is more interesting, but it takes a lot of conceptual groundwork to understand what's going on there. And then we may or may not attempt to conclude with some recipes uh, to identify more critical forms of human life, critical in the criticality, edge of chaos, uh, optimal range of possible states, mathematical sense of the term. So hypothesis one, again, you've all been taught this hypothesis in school. So for sure, if you look in terms of sheer numbers, a Darwinian game, we seem to have been extraordinarily successful as a species. This is a, a curve of the increase, some might say the explosion, the exponential expo explosion of human population in the past 10,000 years alone. 10,000 years is nothing. It is a blink in evolutionary time. And, and really, it's, it's more <laughs> in the past 150 years or so that we have just gone literally off the charts, as it were. So we went from uh, perhaps really as little, as few as a few thousand remaining humans during the last glacial period to now 7 billion. Another thing to consider is that well, we're going to keep revisiting this. Uh, we were, once were, still are, a physiologically very, very weak species. Couldn't even really survive outside without, we couldn't, you know, hunt without tools. So it took a long time to get there. But as weak as we may be, we have parasitically colonized every possible corner of the planet, every possible ecology that you can think of. There's also tons of questions that I hope we'll get to ask again, because you know, what, what drove human migrations? Sure, uh, from, a, from a kind of a Marxist perspective, it was always a search for resources and calories, but calories were mostly to be found in most places, especially when there were a few humans around. So there's also the story somewhere of the search for meaning, the search for myth, the search for further aspiration. It's really just quite remarkable to know that our species, well, proto-sapiens, from the, what we now call the Homo erectus species, left, left Africa almost two million years ago. We'll revisit some of these hypotheses. Well, it turns out that Homo erectus died out, but then Homo sapiens left again and colonized every corner of the planet. So the last, the last place on Earth to be reached by Homo sapiens was, was uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, as we call it now, around the year 1300 AD. And Hawaii was reached about 1,000. Rapa Nui, Easter Island about that time. But yeah, we have colonized every possible, so from frozen tundras to deserts, uh, to, to swampy jungles, to the seas, to, to high plateaus, to now immense cities. It's really just quite remarkable how anti-fragile and how resilient we have been um, as a species. So we don't need to go uh, in detail now in, in, in the whole evolutionary timeline, but remember this, this kind of exponential curve where, uh, where, for example, the debate as to when we became anatomically modern, when, uh, when our ancestors would look physically like the way we look now, we're not sure. It's between 100 and 200,000 years ago, but it's not until about 50, 40,000 years ago that we have evidence of behaviorally modern sapiens a fully symbolic species with art and burial and increasingly complex tools where the timeline again takes a really long time. At some moment, there's about a million years or so during the Homo erectus lineage and barely after that there's almost no evolution in, uh, in tool use. And then, and then and look at, this is only the past 50,000 years. Um, so the timeline, the two million year, the two million year timeline is sort of like 200 times this one. And, uh, and, and here, look, 
the birth of Jesus here, you know, a thousand years ago. It's again a blink of an eye in the past 50,000 years. So there's this capacity to iterate exponentially, uh, and, and that certainly appears to be one of becoming more complex. So this is, in a, in, in a nutshell, the story that many of you have heard before of the, the, the Homo sapiens species being quite weak, being quite fragile, growing up in incredibly volatile and environmental conditions, growing up being at first a prey to many predators, and then slowly, through cultural and technological intelligence alone, becoming the planet's worst predator, even though we, we were not sort of by design, whatever that means, predator. So that's the story, right? From, from simple to complex. It's of course a very uh, imperfect story. There's lots of gaps, but before even exploring the gaps, we should go back and, and explore uh, the opposite hypothesis one of evolutionary mismatch. It, but it's interesting still how it is deeply ingrained in us to have this idea of progress, this idea that anything that's you know, five years old is obsolete. And in a sense, it's true. Cultural evolution is happening so exponentially fast. I see, you see during perhaps before the Industrial Revolution, hundreds of years could span where generation from generation to generation, things were kind of intelligible and kind of almost the same-ish to some extent. But now, I'm, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a Gen Xer or early millennial born in 1979. I have more in common with boomers than I do with older, uh, younger millennials and Generation X. But even when I see my two sons, so one who's 13 and one who's 17, their experience of the internet, their popular culture references are so drastically different as to be like a thousand years apart in terms of what human evolution has, cultural evolution has given us uh, up to now. But so let's, let's problematize this idea of from, from simple to complex. So this is a, a picture taken allegedly not too long ago in Sentinel Island, which is located uh, in the Andaman Island. So it's colonially administered by India. And the Sentinelese are sometimes known as the last uncontacted people on Earth, which is not true, of course. Uh, so the, the, the Indian Ocean, there's been traffic in the in Indian Ocean between Arab and Muslim traders and Chinese and Indonesian. So there have been reports of the Sentinelese since at least Marco Polo in the Western written record. But they, they're a rather conservative people who have maintained their, their hunter-gatherer way of life. And typically don't want contact with outsiders. So there was a case a few years ago where an American missionary got shot uh, by arrows. And the Indian government policy on the Andamanese at this point is one of protectionism. Just, just let them be, let their biodiversity and cultural diversity be. There's uh, an understanding which is probably correct that they may not have immunity to a lot of uh, human uh, zoonotic diseases like the common cold and things that uh, most people in the Eurasian continent have immunity to. So they're mostly left alone. Um, the Andaman Island, by the way, is uh, like different pockets of, of Myanmar, Burma, Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, have people who look phenotypically black. They look phenotypically African, but they're genetically very distant from Africa. So they're thought to be from an earlier waves of sapiens migration before the Austronesian migration, that, uh, where most East Asian people now look sort of Han-like, like Han Chinese-like, same with the Polynesians. So there's a few pockets of these people who look kind of halfway between Africans and Australian Aborigines. But what's interesting about the Andamanese is that I'm sure many of you recall uh, that the tsunami of uh, 2005, 2004, 2005, that absolutely devastated uh, the coast of many places from Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, it even badly hit Japan, India. Um, but it was almost nothing to the Sentinelese because their technology probably looks something like this, is actually very anti-fragile. It, it's very well adapted. They also all possess the kind of environmental and cultural knowledge to be able to move it, to rebuild it. <laughs> So there's something, in fact, very anti-fragile about hunter-gatherer modes of livelihoods that certainly a lot of modern societies have lost. 
So this is something I'm gonna, we're gonna keep revisiting and try to wrap our heads around because the story we're always told is 12,000 years ago at the receiving of the last ice cap, the climate, the last ice age ends, and then environmental conditions begin where agriculture, in places where it's possible, so what is now the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, Iraq, and then later spreading to Egypt, North Africa, Europe, and then, and then the Indus Valley, and then China. Well, then people transition from being hunter-gatherers to being agriculturalists because you can produce more calories and you can feed more people. So then the, the Neolithic Revolution, is thought to have occurred slowly from 12,000 years ago to about 3,000 years ago when most humans, except for a few isolated pockets of people like the Sentinelese, who sort of missed the train of history, became agriculturalists and then a uh, long process that we'll talk about also, then industrial revolution, produce even more food and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you can start even colonizing people better and outsourcing and you know, getting other people to produce food for you. So this, this is always a story that there's something more complex about agriculture. It requires more specialized knowledge. With agriculture, you start seeing the rise of literacy, the rise of more hierarchical societies, but also the rise of more complex networks of trade, of warfare, and so on and so forth. Whereas hunter-gatherers, there's lots of different kinds of hunter-gatherer livelihood, but they're actually quite peaceful and quite egalitarian. But interestingly, they're also generalists. Everybody has to know a lot. So in terms of the cognitive complexity of a hunter-gatherer livelihood, well, say, unlike an agrarian society where it's in one, that's dependent on one crop, one season the crop fails and it's over. You have famine, you have war, you have disease, and this has happened many times over throughout human history. Whereas if you're a hunter-gatherer, the caribou didn't come this season, it doesn't matter because you might know where to find them somewhere else, or there's tons of other species that you know how to interact with. Yes, Julie. Um. I think it's an elementary question, but are you defining, oh, sorry. If that's okay, so, yeah. No. yeah. Sorry. Yep. Let me know if I can. Um, basically, I'm wondering, are you defining complexity as equivalent to amount? Like, is greater amounts equivalent to greater complexity? So, for example, like, more humans equals more cognitive complexity, more buildings equal, do you know, do you know what I'm saying? So yes, yes. Amount, amount, of, amount, amount of entropy, entropy. Amount, amount of possible states, amount of possibilities, conditions of possibility in terms of where you can go, what you can imagine, what you can feel, also the, the kinds of knowledge and the adaptation strategies that you have. But for sure, more humans does not mean more complexity, at least not according to this version of the story. In fact, as we will see, more humans may mean necessarily perhaps even as a function of the natural dynamics of living systems, simplification, standardization, because otherwise, well, how do you get so many humans to coordinate together if you don't have very, very simplifying dynamics? Um, so there's something, of course, very complex about, about hunter-gatherer livelihoods. We'll, we'll, we'll return uh, to, that, to that complexity. But so now, I just want to continue to briefly retell the story of the transition uh, from living in the savanna to being hunter-gatherers to, act to agriculture and so on and so forth as gradually one of the elimination of diversity. So often we're told humans are resilient. The ice age was not anthropogenic in any way, shape or form. There were just random climate fluctuations, but because of changing, because of changing climate, say uh, 30 to 40,000 years ago, humans were able to figure out better tools, better clothes, better hunting technologies. And this is how they became intelligent because they were able to beat environmental unpredictability and produce um, adaptation strategies. But what's interesting is that the more we look back and try to trace when the so-called Anthropocene began, so that geological epoch or era characterized by massive human impact on the environment, which can also be resumed as, uh, pardon me, summarized as elimination of diversity. First of all, elimination of biodiversity. This is a very, very old story uh, for sapiens. So the so-called broad spectrum revolution that we'll cover later is this moment when humans are for sure known to be behaviorally modern, about 50 to 30,000 years ago, when there's an absolute explosion in like new hunting technologies, new you know, bone needles, clothes, lots of cultural diffusion. Well, it seems to coincide pretty much everywhere with whenever humans have depleted the megafauna. 
So they killed the big mammals that were not adapted for human use. And this happened on every continent. To some extent, Africa retained some of those mammals, but a lot of them were exterminated there as well. And in turn, so we destroy the environment, then we have a big problem, then we figure things out and move on and we quote unquote um, evolve again. But it gets even worse. So we know that up until 40, well, 100,000 years ago for sure, there were lots of different sub, so called subspecies of Homo sapiens, meaning there was lots of anatomical variation between proto sapiens. So Homo, Homo erectus is thought to uh, disappear about 100,000 years ago. Uh, same with the Neanderthals, who were sort of in between to simplify. They disappear about 35,000 years ago. The last uh, human so called subspecies to disappear is the so called Homo florensis in what is now Indonesia. We're living on an island and they were the hobbit humans. They were really, really small. Um, again, kind of bad news. It seems that really uh, the last blow for proto sapiens who didn't look like us is that they tend to disappear whenever Homo sapiens arrive. So there's a kind of a paleogenocide hypothesis. Uh, and it, it's quite possible that, say, in the case of Neanderthal, um, in the case of Neanderthal, there might have been some interbreeding, but there might also have been um, some warfare for which there is evidence. We're not sure that sapiens and Homo erectus might have been able to interbreed. We're not sure about Homo florensis. But the bad news is that, yeah, wherever Homo sapiens goes, diversity gets eliminated. So that's one way to look at it, is that one of our greatest strengths in survival strategies is also one of our greatest weaknesses in the ecological sense, but as we will see in lots of other senses of the term, is that human evolution can be argued to be predicated on the elimination of diversity, to produce simplicity, legibility, predictability. Even way back two million years ago in the Homo erectus lineage, a little after two million years ago, the domestication of fire. Humans started um, burning enormous expenses of savanna to be able to shape the migration patterns of the animals that they were hunting, uh, but also to be able to sometimes eliminate the kinds of plants uh, and the kinds of animals that were not particularly useful. So often we say the Anthropocene begins with the European Industrial Revolution. Well, that, that's false. There's just an exponential peak again. Or some people say it begins with the Neolithic transition starting 10,000 years ago. Well, yes, there's another peak, but it begins before. It, begin, it begins for sure, we know, all the way back to two, mil two million years ago. Now, what's interesting is that eliminating diversity, believe it or not, is in a sense what all life forms do, except some are better than others at it, some are more, like humans, aggressive. Um, added than others. But diversity here is not a moral term about just ethnic diversity. That's just, you know, we get hung up on that. That's very important and we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll also need to talk about perhaps reasons why um, as much as we know that diversity, in fact, diversity is good for the soil, is good for the body, is good for the mind, is good for our societies, but we're not very good on average as humans at, um, while tolerating it. So here we're thinking of diversity in information theoretic terms, like too many things, too many adaptation strategies, too many species, some edible, some not. So we minimize the noise, we minimize the complexity. And that's the very definition of life, maintaining yourself in a state of self-organization by resisting chaos, by resisting entropic decay. This is what the human brain is really good at doing, and this is also what human cultural forms of life do. We'll explain that a lot more throughout the semester, so if that's a bit obscure now, don't worry. So it is the case that slowly, in a messy way, humans have made what may or may not be the mistake of abandoning more flexible, more fluid, more complex, uh, modes of livelihood that had much less of an environmental impact uh, and that were much less violent even in terms of competition for resources among human societies to adopt more simplified, predictable, 
labor and stratification and intensive, later taxation incentive, even money is a great, well, it, we know it's the root of all evil, and I think most cultures will tell you that, but money is just a way to simplify transactions, and it, it works a little too well at that. So David Graeber, who was a, a very, very important anthropologist who very tragically died a few weeks ago, has a great book called Death, The First 5,000 Years, where he reviews the history of money. Uh, and the history of money and the history of, of legal and financial systems as basically increased simplification, elimination of diversity of different kinds of gift giving practices, different modes of sociality that were just very, very diverse, uh, but always more complex and always, in a sense, too complex to maintain, or, or that's at least one, one account of it. But the point is because that's the goal of life, that's what brains try to do, that's what bodies try to do. We try to maintain ourselves self-organized, we try to make the world predictable, we try to minimize entropy. This is also why the human mind, for example, is not very good at dealing with nuance, at dealing with ambiguity. We prefer something much simpler. So we can briefly talk about ethnic diversity. Well, one thing that tends to happen whenever there's too rapid a change in any given social system is that the system becomes more bounded, it becomes more conservative. In political terms, this means if there are catastrophes, if there are pandemics, if there are mass waves of migration, Typically, you will see a rise in populism from people who feel entitled for complicated historical reasons, saying, oh, this is my land, and then conflict for meaning over history, as we'll see, is a, is a big, big, a big problem among humans. But think, think of it as a system attempting to maintain itself bounded. And again, this is, this is not a moral story, but if we are interested in the meta-ethics of the system, then it's interesting to study and to understand the conditions under which Things like populism or xenophobic nationalism or totalitarianism might arise. A totalitarian political system is also a very simple one. There's rules, yes or no, right or wrong for everything. It's very top down. It's predicated on the elimination of complexity. We're certainly seeing a lot of attempts uh, in the world of 2020, yes. Um, when you use meta-ethics there, I'm just not sure I fully understand what, what the concept is. So, so with the ethics of a totalitarian system, um, be the ethics of totalitarianism itself and the meta-ethics are like the ethics of applying totalitarianism as a reaction to... No, I would say from a, from a typical normative ethical perspective, we would say populism is bad. We would say totalitarianism is bad and we don't like it. And we're going to say, look at these people there. And fair enough, you know, like that's also, totalitarianism is not the kind of project that I'm interested in. It's not the world I, I'm interested in building. But from a meta-ethical perspective, you, you try to understand the conditions under which populism will arise. From the kind of even more of a system dynamic perspective. Um, so you try to historicize it, you know, in, in, in a kind of a structured way. And then if you understand those mechanisms, perhaps, and if you're, if you're still committed to a normative ethical project about how things ought to be, then you try to address the root cause of the problem um, instead of you know, too quickly jumping to one normative position, which is what we're also wired to do in many ways. I also have a question. Professor? But, so. Wait, These sorry, can you hear me? Quick, like very simplified ways of looking at history. On the one hand, from things that become more complex, we were living in, in, in huts and, and we we're wearing like hides and, and now we have credit card and air travel. So things have become more complex to saying, actually, there's always an attempt to sort of minimize complexity and to minimize diversity. And when you look at, well, credit cards and air travel, it may be complex, but the vectors of travel have never been so deeply etched. In fact, if you don't have a credit card, if you don't have a passport, if you don't participate in, I guess, a, a regime of official reality that has nation states and borders and so forth, if you don't play this game, well, you can't move, or you'll be shot even, or you'll be in prison. So 
This is why when we look at genetic drift and human migration patterns up until the early modern period, it seems random, it's weird. There's people who, there's people whose grandparents, you know, from, I don't know, uh, 1302 to like, you know, 1450, go from Portugal and end up in Siberia. We have no idea what's going on. But now it's much more regimented. You had a question? Yeah, um, I think you might have muted Zoom. Have I muted Zoom? Can Zoom hear me? Oh, I can't hear them. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yes, Professor, I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for whoever said that, because I started talking before and I didn't realize that you couldn't hear me. Um, you get, you get so from what I understand, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. From what I understand, you were sort of talking about how people use cultural institutions as the way to sort of like abandon complex livelihoods. But could you argue that cultural institutions also preserve complexity? You know, because as somebody who is Jewish, like there are a lot of like very specific Jewish customs that like I'm used to, but there are also several different forms of Judaism um, and each have their own very specific rituals. And I'm sure like, most religions are this way, maybe even most families are this way. And I feel like, especially if something just varies tradition, tradition between family and family, in my head, that's also a way of like preserving complexity. And like, we're not all just homogeneous and we all have the same customs. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for bringing that up because of course, remember here, I'm just telling simplified stories that you know, we, we need to recomplexify those ways of looking at history. But for sure, in fact, all cultures, by definition, need to conserve a lot of complexity. They need to conserve a lot of adaptation strategies without which they are completely lost. Because we cannot reinvent language meaning, we cannot reinvent all technology, because there's always a long iterative accumulation of things that were invented before by others and further elaborated by others and so on and so forth. So for example, when Elon Musk and his team come up with like a new self-driving car, there's an iteration on the very, the wheel that was invented in the Neolithic. There's this, this entire, and all these embedded bits of knowledge are there in the package. So of course cultures do that, but cultures differ and historical moments differ in the extent to which uh, they agree to conserve certain aspects of things and rituals and stories that are deemed necessary to function and sometimes invent new ones. So the, 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 different, uh, the, the different denominations of Judaism, like you said, that, that's, that's a good point, right? Like say the reform movement is born in Germany in the 19th century to try to just be a little bit more modern. So now in the reform movement, of course, women can become bat mitzvah. Now we even have gender neutral, you know, Name mitzvah, but then you had the Reconstructionist movement who came a little after and who said, "Whoa, whoa, it's getting a little too modern." So can we just decide on some rituals that we can preserve and so on and so forth and do something else while still being modern? So, and we see schisms in all religions uh, trying to grapple with that problem, and indeed in all cultures. The good thing about religions is that there's often an explicit effort to think about the amount of traditions that we want to preserve and then the amount of openness to change that we need to uh, cultivate. Sometimes in, in a more kind of organic culture, like say, what is Canadian culture? What is youth culture? What is millennials culture? Then it gets a little more complicated, especially in modern times now, because things appear to be at least in some domains that we'll talk about um, today, if I have time, things are changing very, 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 very quickly. So we have this sort of like future lag, this kind of future jet lag, and we lose our grounding completely. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Because I have a question as well. Yes, yes, Brenda. So, you know, if we look at the tools that humans have invented as extensions of ourselves, then yes, from the beginning of the Anthropocene, our tools have gotten more complex and by virtue in a lot of ways we have gotten more complex. But my question is, are we heading to a weaker state as we outsource our knowledge and our physical strength to, for example, computers? You know, can we imagine in a world a hundred years from now, 
kind of similar to like the Wally movie where people just are sitting on these big armchairs all day and they have no physical strength and they have no reason to think because the the computers do all the thinking and so branching off of that do anti-fragility and complexity are they associated on a normal distribution and what kind of relationship do these variables have to one another that's again an excellent question that anticipates a level of analysis that I hope we can get to. Uh, I think that you know the short answer is that complexity and anti-fragility are, are domain specific and context specific. You can't have anti-fragility in every domain. The, the million dollar ethical and aesthetic question for humans is where and when and how might we cultivate anti-fragility and why and when and how might we just you know optimize in, in other ways. Um, we don't know and I like and I like what you ask about computers to not be too attached to the, and, and here I'm speaking to myself because I tend to be a naive primitivist, like a primitivist romantic, uh, deeply critical of modernity, and I always try to work on that, is that outsourcing knowledge and skills to others into a repertoire and to optimize even cognitive efficiency, this is what humans are good at. This is our strength and there's nothing wrong with that. So even in learning language and learning tool use, we're just, we're outsourcing everything, most of it, and that's completely normal. But when is it going too far? For sure, later in the semester, when I talk about my research on the impact of smartphones, it seems that we have built uh, networks that literally resemble the human mind that is already optimized to like download packages of knowledge from other minds. Perhaps we do it too much. Perhaps we're losing uh, a little bit of our, perhaps there's some fundamental capacities uh, and even brain functions and physiological functions that we're, not, uh, that we're not using anymore, and perhaps that comes at a cost. And in fact, this is, this is what I want to explore now in, in the next few slides, a story that is, again, necessarily simplified, but one of examining so-called evolutionary, evolutionary mismatch in different domains. So one of them is the so-called epidemiological transition. So this is interesting. Perhaps not all of you know that Many more people on the planet die of cardiovascular diseases than famine. This is very, very new to humans. In other words, humans die more of obesity-related diseases or, or eating too much of the wrong kinds of food than famine. And this is 2016. Now the curve is, is almost the same. And um, well. COVID would, be, COVID would be just about here uh, as a black swan unexpected event. So the so-called diseases of civilization are now causing more damage than basic ailments of survival. And this is true for everyone on average, not that there is still no famine. Same with wars. Where are... Suicide should be in there. So suicide is about 800,000 to a million people per year. Anyway, many more people die of suicide than they do of homicides, wars and terrorism included. More and more, we're beginning to realize that by far the most violent of all social institutions is the self. And, and then the family and so on and so forth but we do more damage to ourselves than any other species, that's for sure. If you take the complicated construct of mental health and uh, mental health problems and substance use disorders as an imperfect metric, an indicator of flourishing, but also of resilience and anti-fragility. Well, they also appear to be diseases of progress. It's again much more complicated. If you look at suicide, there's, there's differences as well, right? So, so Guyana, for example, surprisingly is always one of the highest suicide rates, mostly South Asian males in, in, in Guyana. But in many, many ways, we're finding that so-called diseases of progress and diseases of civilization of which mental health is becoming the number one burden of disease, 
are an absolute disaster. Yes. So, um, I was wondering, um, when you say like looking at depression or substance use as like a metric of, <laughs> sorry, yeah, or like as like a metric of anti fragility, do you mean that? Um, people developing disorders and like living with disorders is anti-fragile or do you mean that um people developing more and more disorders um marks more fragility and could one argue that that may just be because of our classification systems for these disorders yeah yes yeah, yeah, yeah. of course of course and classification systems and and there, there are idioms of distress, ways of being unwell that are culture bound, that are others that are more universal. Culture always plays a role in it. Of course, the exportation of the Western biomedical disease classification system is itself uh, a form of colonization, you might say. But at the same time, for things like depression is universally recognized in all cultures. There's an idiom of distress to recognize someone who is constantly low mood. Who, uh, who has sleep sleeping problems, who no longer feels joy, who has hopelessness, thinking too much, ruminating, thinking bad thoughts and so forth, being really, that's universal, that's recognized. So it's always good and important to ask questions about the extent to which things are complete, just false social constructions, but it, it's, it's interesting to look at ways in which some things you know, might, might not entirely be just that. So for things like depression, schizophrenia, Autism, so autism is not a mental illness, it's, it's, a, it's a neurodevelopmental style or condition, but these are things that would be recognized in all culture as, okay, this, this person is unwell, and what's going on? And it's on the rise. So for sure, there's tons of factor, you know, this is, this is what we, we discussed for one whole semester in, in, in my other class, and, and the desirability sometimes of these categories, and, and big pharma, like all of, these, all of these are linked, but there is something going on, there is something going on, there is something, there's a link with loneliness, for example. Um, there is a lot more distress. Uh, it seems in the West, because we might also say, there are also the realists who say, actually, uh, it's because we lack the proper diagnostic tools and survey methods to find people, say, in, in, in Peru, or Papua New Guinea, but actually we would have the same rate. So that's one position out there uh, that not, not everyone in global mental health agrees with, I would say up to two thirds of scholars in global mental health don't agree with that position, but, but there's, there's debates, there's debates on that. Um, so I, 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 for one, I'm of the opinion that, again, depression is a universal human category. There's lots of complicated pathways and factors. Some of them are even genetic. Uh, some people are born with a more negative thinking style, but a lot of it is given by social cultural context. And a lot of our, current changes in patterns of social dynamics, especially loneliness, and especially I'm gonna get their changes in the level of meaning, um, are largely responsible for making people feel more unwell. But that's just, that's, just one, that's just one hypothesis. So we know also, and we know, we know this in the context of, uh, of student populations and in the context of youth in general, yes? Um, I just kind of want to tease out that point that you just made mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. uh, like sociocultural shaping as being um, a primary factor, if, if I could put it in those words, for the development or rise in development of, of disorders like depression. Um, but it is a lot of support for something like depression having like a very neural basis as well that's communicated through genetic pathways or um oh that's, yeah. that's a separate so, yeah, yeah. but would you say that so you like would you say that at one point however far back like when you make the argument of social sociocultural um things shaping that would you say that those were the things that shaped the genetics that changed to therefore produce later on down the line more depression in society? Or like, how do you tie the two together? I don't know, it's so multifactorial <laughs> and complex. Uh, 
I think what we know is that there are cognitive profiles and affective profiles of people who tend towards more low affect or who tend towards more catastrophization uh, or more, more negative thinking. And those are more at risk of having a style of distress that now in our cultures we would call depression because there's lots of other factors. But um, hypervigilance, catastrophization, uh, a propensity to prefer negative information, meaning information that conveys cues about possible threats, is completely normal. In fact, it was necessary for a species to develop this, these kinds of like paranoid tendencies. But then when you take these normal proclivities and some people who for complicated reasons have even more vulnerabilities and you put them in a context that is completely crazily depressogenic, then you have the kind of epidemic that, that, that we have now, including but you know, we're, we're not there yet, maybe, maybe I'll get a chance to discuss this, including some maladaptive coping strategies that mean well, but that accidentally end up making people feel worse. There's, there's, a, lot of that, there's a lot of that going on. But it's again, not that simple, uh, but we have the same micro version of the debate about why do we have more, say, depression in mental health and substance use problems? Well, did I say depression? Uh, among uh, rich countries and poor countries. And you find roughly the same in Western countries where it's more of a high socioeconomic status problem. Again, it's not that simple. There are many people uh, who are not rich and, and, and who can be depressed. It could also be that they don't have access to resources and services, but, but more and more, the data is pointing towards showing that there is diseases of affluence in this sense as well. Uh, and it's complicated because it often, when we point that out, it often sounds like a moral judgment. It's like, oh, why can't these just fragile kids help themselves? But no, that is not the point. The point is that, is that for tons of complicated multifactorial reasons, the distress is very real, it's there, these experiences are there, and we need to make sense of them. Like, what, what, is, what is going on? So many people, in sometimes moralizing language, sometimes language that sounds moralizing but is not, have been talking about the erosion of re resilience, the erosion of anti-fragility among rich Western elites, in particular among university students, because yeah, there's, there's an enormous demand for help. Uh, there are very sincere cries for help from a population of people, many of whom are not doing well. So, so we need to understand what's going on. Um, at the same time, I only meant this, mention this briefly now, but there's a lot of polarization. The culture wars have never been this, this sharp, this, this potent. And by culture wars, I simply mean conflict over meaning and conflict over normative models of the world. So people trying to they have a vision of the world and, and, and they want to defend their vision of the world uh, because like basically all humans, they mean well for the world, but there's a lot of conflict um, over this. Yeah, the death of despair. I should point out, of course, it's, it's, it makes me sad to point this out because, because well, but all of this is getting, all these slides are about the year and a half old. All of this is becoming a lot worse with the COVID event. And there are many surveys, uh, one of which I and some colleagues conducted, showing that young people, especially those who use the internet a lot, are, are much more at risk of COVID-related anxiety and depression than older people. Which, then again, we have the same problem in reverse. You have older generations, uh, those grumpy boomers that, that young people don't like anymore, uh, who are actually at risk, like no question. Uh, they're definitely for sure. Uh, and in fact, the risk of mortality or complications with COVID increases with age. But they're much less scared. Much less scared than young people. Um, so what, what's going on? There's, and the studies from, from Canada, from the US, from, even from China, showing the same kind of trend. So this trend is also globalizing, uh, the trend of, to make a long story short, the more developed, uh, the more culturally evolved, well, in a sense, the, the more at risk of being mentally unwell or, or possibly, um, possibly physically unwell. I typically require a lot more time in conversation to go through each of these every points because yes, again, it's not, it's not that complicated, but these are, this holds for the US and Canada and most of Western Europe. Um, 
actually economic conditions are not so, so bad. Uh, they've changed a lot, they're complicated, and we're gonna, we're gonna explain that, but there's a lot of wealth around, unemployment rates are low. Similarly, murder rates have been going down and down and down, they've been going down since, uh, oh, since about the 1400s, they're at, at an all time low. Um, but fear of crime is up. So that's also interesting. There's an inverse correlation between how much a place is actually dangerous in terms of uh, the common easy to measure metrics of physical danger, like being physically assaulted or murdered, uh, but people are more afraid. Parenting culture in the West has changed enormously. It is being exported as a cultural package to the rest of the world, what you might call lawnmower parenting, helicopter parenting, tiger parenting to some extent, yes? So, um, would a way to put um, the problem of over connectivity is that it makes a world that's less complex seem more complex to the individual? So the question is, would a world that is less complex seem more complex to the individual? That's your question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to answer it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip, skip some slides because you know, we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, Sorry, I keep forgetting. No, no, that, that's fine, that's fine. Skip a lot of the theory bits. Um, so long story short, some people have been proposing a hypothesis that the world is just becoming too physically safe. And because our brains and bodies and social strategies evolve that way, we require some amount of disorder, some amount of unpredictability, some amount of adversity in the environment. Otherwise, kind of like uh, what happened to peanut allergies, we're not able to rehearse basic cognitive, physiological, and social functions, and then we become fragile. Say when actual change happens, something like COVID, like a black, black swan event, uh, then we have no way of dealing with it. So this is the so-called evolutionary mismatch hypothesis. Similarly, uh, we have, I mentioned, we have a strong negativity bias. We're obsessed with identifying potential threats. A lot of contemporary anxiety can be explained that way. We have these threat detection modalities that constantly go in overdrive. We've gotten rid of most threats, really. We've been doing that. We've been killing predators for two million years. Um, and then, depending on the kind of cultural narratives we have access to, then, then it just it glitches. So this is the evolutionary mismatch hypothesis. Similarly, we found out a little too late that by getting rid of all peanuts uh, in most schools, because of, say, one in 1,000 child who was at risk of anaphylaxis, then more kids became allergic because they did not encounter enough immunological stressors. So the hypothesis is there, and don't have too much time to go into these, which is too bad, we'll, we'll, we'll look at those later. But there's lots of ways of showing that some amount of adversity in multiple domains is really good to become resilient. And it's as though there is an inverse correlation between the amount of stressors available in a system and the, and the resilience of its organisms. In other words, if you get rid of all stressors, you have fragile beings. But if you have a stressful environment, you have anti-fragile beings. But of course, it's not that simple because some stressors will also actually kill you. Death by a thousand cuts. You know, micro fracture after micro fracture, eventually, you know, your bones break down. So that, that for sure happens. Yes, are you able to connect? Are you connected on Zoom? Or per, yeah. uh, it's just a quick question. On the slides with the childcare mm -hmm. um, graph, uh, graphs, it was one picture, I think it was France. Yeah, it was France. Um, because France is awesome. Mm -hmm. La République. No, uh, no, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I will show that slide. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is from a, a poll by The Economist, really, really brilliant stuff, showing how over the past, you know, since, since the 1960s, in each generation, children have been more and more overprotected. So that's also the idea of the developmental harms of helicopter parenting is that if, if children are not left to their own devices, to some extent, to be able to learn how to solve problems, uh, 
how to design you know, strategies without supervision, then they're not, they're not resilient. So it's, it, and, uh, and yes, the time, it's interesting because this is daily childcare by mothers, by education level in all of these countries that have been going up. What also happened since the 1960s is that women entered the workforce. So these women are working more and they're pulling a double shift, they're going home and they're doing everything for their kids. And this increases with socioeconomic status, of course. This is why, uh, and this is, this is music to my ears, there's more and more research showing that you know, children who grew up in adversity, who did not have parents who were able to drive them to soccer practice and, and clarinet practice and look over their homework and stuff, a lot of the time are much more resilient than, than some kids who were, who were tiger, tiger parent. But again, it, it's not that simple. As you'll see when you read the, the book, The Triple Package, Amy Chua uh, also wrote a book about uh, the benefits of being a tiger mother. She thinks she has identified uh, the cultural package that will make very successful kids. She may be right, who knows? So because we don't have that much time left and I want to, I, I want there to be more discussion. I'm very happy that people are asking questions. Um, I'll present yet another simplification. Uh, so one of the hypotheses could have been that actually the more adversity, the better. It's probably not that simple. As again, it's not that simple that humans uh, forms of life went from very simple to very complex or from very complex to simple. In fact, there's multiple trajectories. So this book, Against the Grain, um, I'll show it some other time, but if you look at the human record closely, it's not like this linear, ta linear time scale of hunter-gatherers sort of happily moving into villages and then into cities and so forth. There's often a lot of resistance. In fact, there are populations that uh, experimented with being agrarian or that were forcefully recruited into early agrarian societies and then decided, oh, screw that, it's too much hard work for like bad calories. Because in the Neolithic transition, and those of you who are interested in paleo diets and that sort of thing probably know this, but humanity took a hit in many ways. So we had a population explosion, but then lots of health problems as a result of having relying on mono diets and especially single grains. So humans for a while had shorter statures, lower bone density, they started having cavities, they started having all of the, the diseases uh, like measles and the flu and smallpox uh, because of humans and animals living in those conditions. So there were some humans who were actively trying to resist that. They said, no, 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 we're, we're much happier in the woods. But then, long story short, there was like trading and so on that happened. But it is the case that by, uh, by the early modern period, most people had been forcefully recruited into uh, really most of them into agrarian or in increasingly industrialized, meaning simplifying modes of livelihoods. But there are still, there are still differences. In, in a lot of the global south, as much as all the world has been forcefully recruited into European modes of economies and so forth, and of course their traditional cultures and livelihoods took a toll uh, as a result, but on an anti-fragile hypothesis, sometimes not being too recruited into modernity, say not having access to suburbia and iPhones and McDonald's and so forth, uh, might be protective in other ways. So what's interesting in a lot of uh, Global South countries is that you have multiple temporalities. You have pre-modern and post-modern temporalities. You have different kinds of life strategies. And you have, uh, you have projects, uh, even urban projects that are a lot messier that contain a lot more noise, a lot more, a lot more entropy. So if, again to, again, to simplify, you take big global cities like Lagos in Nigeria, you know, Karachi in Pakistan, you know, New Delhi, uh, et cetera, you have a lot of poverty, high noise and pollution levels, much higher crime rates, uh, higher vulnerability to, to natural disasters and so forth. But on average, and of course, it is the gross simplification, anthropologists should not do that, but you find on average people, especially if they grew up there, so say if you go to New Delhi for the first time and you try to rent a moped or a car, you'll probably be stressed out, like really stressed out if you, if you grew up in the West. Uh, but you'll find people quite flexible, resilient, often patient. Patience is very interesting because it means uh, something unexpected happens and you don't freak out. You're like, oh, sure, I mean, that could have happened too. Yes, Gilly? Um. Yes. 
um, is, <laughs> is there a correlation between the sort of non weird um, ecologies and uh, a level of consonants? Like, is that, could that adaptability and resilience be due to high cultural consonants and less actually <laughs> yes. variability in the environment? Yes, I think it, exactly, exactly. Uh, we, we don't even need to talk about it in terms of consonants, but yes, exactly. Because uh, I'll, I'll just power through the rest of the slides. You know, so weird ecologies, physical ecologies, of course, conversely, are much more safe, much more prosperity, equality, low crime rates, accidents, et cetera. Everything is at an all-time low and so forth. Uh, everything is hyper-regulated. Uh, another thing is sometimes if you go to the global south and practices will be registered to you, to your Western mind as, oh, this is corrupt or this is scamming or this is cheating. But in fact, it's just more flexible. It, it's just more flexible, more adaptive, more considerate at times of human strategies as opposed to sometimes, no, the system is a system, the system won't let you. I wish it could help you, but no. I'm gonna press this button, it's efficient, it, it happens all the time. If I had the time now, I'd give you my spiel on why I think corruption is virtue, but I don't, I don't have time to do this. But now if you go back to social ecologies. So in non-weird cultures, most of the global south, uh, this is, this is absolutely wrong. It should say predictable. This is a typo. There's a very predictable social world. There are recognizable kinship structures, participation in rituals, social and semiotic bearings. A lot of the time, if you live in a society, I'm of the clans of the blacksmith, like my father, I'll become a blacksmith. I know in, at such and such an age, the matchmaker will give me a wife. Everything is just sort of paved out. Again, it's a simplification. But there's enormous opportunities for social support through extended families, clans, and religion. Participation in religious ritual provides a lot of social support, but also a lot of predictable meaning. And the burden of choice, the burden of having to invent your whole, your whole existence is just not there. Now, conversely, you take your typical weird social ecology, and typically the richer, the more unsafe. So family structures, gone. Religion, over. Systems of belief over. Recall that now we're in the process of even rewriting history for, further. Now, for, for young, weird people, the world is scary, but not even history is scary. We remove statues. We, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying that there's, there's an attempt, there's a lot of mistrust in the world and other people, even in the past, even in the stories. There's an extremely high individual burden to rediscover some kind of truth, to rediscover, rediscover some kind of path, dreams, goals, meaning, ideal partners. And there's a lot of loneliness that can just be measured. You can just look from space, you know, how do the nodes move and, and who do they interact with? People are very, very lonely. Loneliness puts people at a higher risk uh, of heart disease and smoking. So it's a lot of, a lot of social uh, uncertainty, a lot of social unpredictability, a lot of social entropy. We can, and we're gonna keep examining, examining this from the perspective of different, uh, of different social packages. But again, you might look at the inverse correlation between adversity and resilience, but it's domain specific, or at least here we're beginning to paint sort of different domains. So if you have low social predictability, you have high social chaos, high environmental predictability, you have low environmental chaos. And it may very well be that in a lot of weird societies, there's really just not enough environmental chaos. First of all, you know, go learn how to ride a bike on your own, fall down, learn how to get back up, you know, learn, learn how to fend for yourself a little, you know, discover that sometimes the world does not come. According, things don't just work according to plan. So again, there's something extremely productive about growing up in a country where the trains don't run on time or where there are no schedules. Even if you travel uh, in the remote Amazon, well, it's really difficult. It can take you up to three days to find uh, someone who will take you up river to where you want to go. Well, imagine growing up there versus growing up somewhere where you know the metro runs on time like clockwork. And when it doesn't, it creates this, you feel awful, you feel really upset. And the social uh, predictability, which is, there's nothing. There, it's, it's a very, very, very scary world. And I, and I see this and I see children and the amount, the amount, of, the amount of questions, the amount of, 
blaming themselves for having to reinvent everything in the world that I find, it's, I find it almost cruel. So no wonder. Now, non-weird societies, on average, you know, and again, it's socioeconomically stratified and so forth, you have, you have the opposite pattern. Yes, are you, are you able to connect on the... Are you connected? Go on. Oh, you're in the waiting? Oh, sorry, yes, I just admitted you. Thank you. So, so my question uh, was, can, can uh, low social predictability like what, why doesn't social predictability raises resilience in weird societies? Because we're saying that because there is a high environmental predictability, the resilience uh, goes down. Mm -hmm. But why doesn't it goes up because of the low social, social predictability? Like why, why does the fact that there's a high, high social chaos makes people uh, less resilient like in my in my head people oh yeah no this is just this is just a stupid way that i have okay. of representing it because i'm i'm representing high social predictability but then i have i have the resilience uh i have the resilience but uh yeah but my question is low. can 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 low social predictability oh no this is longer so this is uh raise resilience it probably can to some extent. Yeah. Uh, it probably can and does to some extent, which is why you see so much, I'm hesitant to use this phrase because it's so moral, so much progress, so much change. Because of course, in, in, in conditions of adversity, most of the time, most people rise up to the occasion because the human species history is one of encountering adversity and just rising beyond. So for sure, so there's lots of amazing things in the context of this social chaos that are, that are being created and that are very nuanced. But we're also seeing a lot of, right now in the West, we're also seeing a lot of buffering attempts at recreating simplicity that are a little too simple, like conspiracy theories, for example. And, and the internet most assuredly does not help. But all these new, the conspiracy theory is kind of like a new religion or a new culture. There's an explanatory model about the world, you know, there's, there's, there's the moral compass, and typically we point, these are the culprits and these are, these are the good people. So the return to populism um, is certainly one attempt at recreating social predictability, uh, new age, like fat diets, yoga, mindfulness, all these things. You, you, you're seeing people attempting to recreate some kind of meaning. And then, of course, who is to say which is a good and which is a bad strategy? But for sure, if you examine the, the gross outline of what's happening in the culture wars, and unfortunately, as exemplified, uh, exacerbated in, and to some extent stemming from even the US elections, you see a lot of really just simplistic discourse on one side and on the other. Uh, a, lot, a lot of attempts to identify culprits. We'll talk about that more later when we talk about like threat modalities like Pascal Boyer's book is, is, is really good at that. But, but again, who's to know? Uh, when all you have is uh, a hammer, you have to have a nail. And of course, as a researcher, my hammer is to look at anti-fragility and so forth and to look at also fragility. And so I'm, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of fragility right now. Um, in fact, uh, even our, the, even even the global response to the COVID the event, which is the grander scheme of a humanity, is not true. Let me remind you all: we're not exactly, we're not talking like 19. We're not talking about Black Plague here. Uh, we're not talking about the Little Ice Age um, in the 1700s when one third of humanity perished from famine. Uh, 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 Look at the response, look at the distress, look at the, 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 the rise in uh, substance abuse, death of despair, isolation, developmental, the cost of children spending more time online and so forth. Um, 
by many accounts, it's a disaster, not because there is a, a bad virus uh, that, that does a lot of bad things to very vulnerable bodies, but because humanity is freaking out. I'd, I'd love to take uh, one, more, one more question or comment or rebuttal. Um, Zoom friends, anything to add or ask? No? Classroom friends? Yes, Gilly? Um, does, does this model kind of bank on suffering as necessary for progress or resilience? Like, I'm not sure because for, for a signal to be interpreted as suffering, it requires a cognitive and cultural interpretation. So I don't actually know what suffering is. But does suffering as it tends to be glorified in a lot of in a lot of extreme forms of religiosity and politics and so forth? Probably not. Probably not. But I'm not sure we need to frame and define things as suffering because suffering is complex, right? Even physical pain. If you take athletics or sadomasochism or like uh, you know, aestheticism, there's so many practices where we engage in things that would be registered or coded as pain in another context. But then they're not defined and rewarded in a such experience like that. So, so I, really, I really don't know. But I would say suffering is too moral a question. I, 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 can't, I don't know how to answer it, but I would say some amount of adversity in the information theoretic sense, like unpredictability, things that we just could not account for, absolutely. Because we can try as much as possible to make the world conform to our model, and this is what we're very good at, but the world is always going to come with things that we didn't expect. And if we're not prepared for it, then, then by definition, we're neither resilient uh, nor anti-fragile. We are at best robust, but very vulnerable to a uh, big storm. That's what I would say. OK, well, I believe, it, uh, uh, no, let, let, let's, take, you know, let's take one final question. And then if, if, uh, if people want to disconnect, they're, they're, of course, allowed to do it. Uh, but let's take your question. And then. Um, yeah, I just had a question around, like, how does this picture really fit in with um, like the reading for today and the idea of um, people who have like ex or experience less cultural consonants um, having like more psychological distress um, so if we're using that as a measure to essentially quantify like oh like less col cultural consonants equals bad outcomes um so but because that's what i would i mean that's what right, i would right, right. Was right. well this is what i wanted to introduce more concepts before getting into uh, cultural consonants more but if called if cultural is a mismatch between and what, and what you get there are social and cultural systems in which it's a, it's a lot easier for the system to pretty much give you what you expect but then, but then in the, in the context, context of high social, high semiotic or cultural entropy, we don't even know what we want. want. The the ones that are always, always trying to explain by definition, cultural consonants become impossible. It becomes very much more difficult because the cultural model is too entropic, like gas, gas and changes all the time. Then you're, you're trying to catch up with something that just never materializes. That's what I just said. Anyway, I've yeah, held you captive long enough. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I will see you all on uh, Thursday.